Do you ever wonder how successful entrepreneurs built their businesses from scratch? Are you unsure if starting a business is for you? Well, tune in as we discuss how successful entrepreneurs transformed their ideas into reality. Welcome back to From Zero to Revenue with your host, Chris Yap. Welcome back. You are listening to the podcast show From Zero to Revenue, the show that features the journey of successful entrepreneurs from around the world. I'm your host, Chris Yap. Today, we will discuss very important tips on how to raise capital from a venture capital firm. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Gaptic Global, your one-stop shop outsourcing company for LinkedIn marketing, customer service, and various back office services. You can learn more about their services at www.captechglobal.com. I'm truly honored to introduce our very special guest today, a highly regarded entrepreneur, a venture capitalist from Canada, Mr. Stuart Brown. Welcome to the show, sir. Hello, Chris. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, Stuart, this is another testament of how powerful LinkedIn is. You know, I reached out to you via LinkedIn and you responded, and here we are today. You know, you you are in our show, so I'm excited to have you here. No, thanks for having me. Uh, so, uh, Stuart, you know, being the CEO of PyCap Ventures, uh, how did this come about, and what was your vision with this company? Well, you know, this um, the story of how this came about is actually pretty relevant to where the economy is right now, and um, I'm often uh, asked to speak at different MBA schools and and talk with students who are facing kind of hard times as they graduate. I started PiCap Venture Partners uh, shortly after I graduated from my MBA program. And I graduated in uh, 2009. So that was the last economic crisis. Right. And um, so my intention for going to MBA school originally was to get into investment banking. But because the, the whole banking industry got hammered so hard, by that, uh, the you know the, the um, subprime mortgage uh, situation and all of the fallout from that, uh, I had to kind of reevaluate what I was going to do with my career. And so I got a lot of um, great experience through various contract uh, jobs, working for a junior mining company, working in investor relations, and then I started uh, working as an advisor for this national angel capital organization. And through working with them, I uh, learned all about angel investing, uh, startup tech companies, and that kind of led me to gain insight into the world of venture capital. And I just totally fell in love with it because it was just such a perfect fit for me between uh, finance, uh, technology, and entrepreneurship. And then growing up, and obviously, you know, from Canada, was that always the dream? Like, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I want to be in the fan finance. I mean, what was the dream growing up? And then how did that transition to, you know, taking finance and college and getting to where you are today? You know what? My dream growing up was actually um, different. It was, uh, I wanted to be in filmmaking. I wanted to be a director. Oh. And, um, but you know what, I, I guess I was a little arrogant uh, when I was in high school and I felt that I was too good for film school. So I, I wanted to, and it, it just, the film industry was, for me, it was, a, it's a great uh, industry, great career choice. It was just a little too creative. And my personality is one that it needs to have something more tangible, something more grounded in numbers and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I studied business on undergrad worked in marketing, did some film on the side. And then I just, I really liked the idea of getting into finance and investing because my job at the time was in uh, brand management. And I did a lot of traveling to a bunch of different countries, but I was only dealing with one brand and one company and one product line day in and day out. And no matter if I was going to Korea, Brazil, or all over Europe, I would still see the same competitors and have to deal with the same products all day, every day. So I thought, okay, well, it'd be so much more interesting if I were to get into finance and investing, because then I'm exploring all of these different industries and all of these different types of companies, and I can manage them on a uh, holistic level. And it would be a lot more interesting for me. 
awesome. That's that's a great story. So I guess arrogance pays somehow, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> you know, you you discover talents, and I mean, you know what? Growing up, I always thought I was going to be an accountant because I looked up to my grandfather, and he was an accountant. Uh, in fact, he paid for my college as long as I promised that I was going to take accountancy. So I did took up accountancy for two years, but man, accountancy didn't like me. <laughs> so I shifted to entrepreneur entrepreneurship and man, that's when I found my thing. So I, I was engaged into different kinds of businesses while I was in college, while all my friends were partying, I was selling different stuff. I remember selling like sausages. I would go door to door in our neighborhood. And this was back in the Philippines. Um, so it was kind of weird, but I, I know what you're saying. You know, sometimes uh, your purpose just it unfolds uh, by itself. So so with PyCap, you've had this for almost 10 years now, right? Starting from 2011. Tell us a little bit more about PyCap um, and what kind of um, portfolios do you actually have appetite on? Okay, so we're, we're pretty much industry agnostic. If you go on to our website and you check out the portfolio mm -hmm. uh, webpage there, like our portfolio holdings, you'll see there's med tech companies, there's a veterinarian tech company there. Uh, we have FinTech, we have ag tech. So our focus for our investment is pretty much industry agnostic. We'll invest in uh, any type of company that just that looks interesting and um, has strong ability to scale and is disruptive and it has a strong management team. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, we see, all, we see it as a, a, the type of company where we can add a lot of strategic value. Awesome. So I noticed that most VCs are definitely looking at more like tech uh, related uh, companies. Are you exclusively focused on tech companies or are you also open to like traditional, maybe service-based businesses? What's your take on that? Right. Okay. Yeah. So when I was saying industry agnostic, I meant uh, technology that touches, you know, many different industries, but it, it's true. And venture capitalists predominantly invest in tech companies, especially in Canada. And I would say within technology, there's a focus and an emphasis on software. Right. And the reason for that is because VCs invest at a very early stage. And at that early stage, there's a lot of risk. And, you know, finance 101 dictates that if you're going to invest in something that's risky, of course, you want the potential for return to overcome the uh, level of risk that you're investing in. And uh, because software companies um, are very, you know, not as capital as intensive as other types of uh asset classes that we could be investing in, um, the ability for us to use a small amount of capital and get a, a large return uh, is a lot stronger than, than other areas we could be investing in. Sure. So, so maybe, Stuart, you can, you know, for, for our listeners who are not very sure what venture cap capitalists uh, exactly do, can you give us like a venture capital kind of one-on-one uh, kind of overview what it is and how it differentiates with like seed funding, Series A funding, and all that good stuff. Yeah, no problem. So when we're talking about uh, seed and Series A funding, so that is venture capital investing. That's that's the common terms we use. But the thing that really differentiates a uh, venture capital fund from other types of funds, like a private equity fund or a hedge fund, well, I would say more a differentiator from a hedge fund or like a mutual fund or an ETF is that a venture capitalist invests into companies and then takes an active role in helping that company grow. Okay. Oftentimes when a VC invests into a deal, they take a seat on the board of directors or provide some other sort of advisory or, or strategic value. With COVID now, you know, with the pandemic keeping us all up at night, um, has the pandemic shift? Has it shifted your investment priorities as far as you know the type of companies you feel like investing on? Yeah, it, it has, and I mean, any anyone who says otherwise, I think is, um, I think subconsciously it has to have an effect. I mean, the world is is changing as like right under our feet, and um, so inherently, uh, it, it it causes investors to take a lot less risk. 
because there's when there's so much risk in the economy and in the market, you, you don't want to add more risk within your investing. So what that means is, is that VCs are, there's a trend for VCs to be investing in later stage companies as opposed to early, because the earlier you get, the, the more risky it is. And the focus more now, especially in Canada, is to put money into deals that has a solid uh, business model and an ability to generate revenue and kind of stand on its own two feet, as opposed to investing in companies that are like a moonshoot, where you're just putting money in, hoping that it's going to get bought out for a couple billion dollars. Sure. So with that said, I know you said you're, you're industry agnostic. Um, with the pandemic, did it kind of change your preference though as far as which industry should you focus on i'm just kind of assuming that healthcare might be more appealing versus others or i might be wrong what are your thoughts on that no that's a great that's a great question you know what i i think this this is actually advice for for any entrepreneur out there mm -hmm. it's not so much that we're shifting our focus on the type of industry we're putting money into i mean i'm mm -hmm. speaking from a personal standpoint from our, our uh, investment vehicle we're looking for entrepreneurs who have a sound ability to adapt with the current economy and an ability to uh, be agile enough uh, to, to turn whatever is going to happen in the future into a uh, strategic opportunity to get their company in a better position, as opposed to the type of entrepreneur who's going to hide his head in the sand and wait for this thing to blow over, because we don't know how long that's going to take. Mm. That, that, is, that is so true. Um, I would imagine like, you know, you, 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 you're probably reviewing a ton of deals every year. You're probably reviewing different opportunities here and there. Um, what do you think are the top five kind of like qualities of a startup that makes you say, uh, this is a no brainer. I, I gotta, I gotta invest on this. Um, do, you, do you have like a top five criteria on, I guess the other way of putting it is what should, entrepreneurs be mindful of when they're trying to raise capital okay so first and foremost and, and you know this is this is pretty much industry standard mm -hmm. uh we look for a strong management team okay. because the the theory is is that ideas are a dime a dozen yeah. and but it, it takes the it takes the right type of person to execute on those ideas sure. so you might have the best product the best company the best opportunity in the world but if you don't have people that know how to execute on that, if they're not focused, driven, open-minded, then it's likely the company's not going to succeed. Um, so that, that's always the number one is the management team. Secondly, of course, it's the, um, the, the business model, the product or service that's being offered. Uh, is it scalable? Like, does it have the ability to uh, grow exponentially? That's another thing. Right. So it, the, the, the fundamentals of the business itself has to, has to fit the, the risk and return profile that we're looking for as a venture capital investor. Uh, the other thing is that um, we, we need, and of course, this is more important now than it has, ever has been, uh, we need to see traction and market validation. So the, the, the entrepreneur needs to prove to us that people want what the entrepreneur is, is looking to produce or sell or, or provide. And VCs are not looking to invest into companies or entrepreneurs that are using the money to figure out what their business model is or to test the market. Like all of that should be done ahead of time. We want to put money into a company where that money is going to fuel is, is like fuel for a fire that's already burning. Mm. We don't want to strike the match ourselves. So that's a big differentiator between your type of investing strategy versus an angel investor where, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, an, an angel investor would typically fund an idea, but yours, your, your, your focus is more of, you know, this, this has to be working already. There's some level of traction before you actually put your, some funding on, in other words, your focus is more growth versus startup. Is, is that accurate to say? Sure. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the terminology you can use in different uh, purposes, but 
that's basically it. So the, the main thing that, that uh, entrepreneurs who are looking for financing need to understand when they, when they compare angels with VCs is angels are investing their own savings so mm -hmm. they can do whatever they want with it. Okay. They could put their money into a restaurant or give money to someone who just has an idea. Uh, although I think the trend is more they would want someone who at least has a working prototype and that sort of thing. But VCs are, are managing other people's money. So we have to be, of course, extra careful and we have to do things in a proper VCs do want to see traction in the market and, and that the product or service is validated. But that doesn't mean that the company has to have revenue, although that is the best um, form of traction. That's the best proof that the company has a sound business model. But failing that, companies can still raise money from VCs and, but prove the traction in other ways, like, you know, LOIs from potential, potential customers, a letter of intent, uh, even a purchase order would be good. Mm -hmm. um, or just, you know, maybe very positive uh, feedback from a sample set of uh, users. So if there's a beta version out there of the product and, you know, you have 50 to 100 people who have used it and they all seem to like it and they in, they've indicated that this is something they would pay for. I mean, though, that that could work as well. Awesome, I see. You, you know, Stuart, what what I find so admirable about you and what you do, and you know, in your industry, is basically you're the enabler, right? You enable these entrepreneurs, um, not just really, not just entrepreneurs. It's as far as fulfilling their dreams, but the the value of these services that's you know the benefit of it to the consumers or the users of the the business is just incredible like you know if airbnb or uber if they weren't funded by vcs would be stuck in hotels and taxis right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so, so to that point i i know you're you're very involved in the canadian community uh uh Entrepreneur, entrepreneurs community in Canada. Um, what is it that excites you in kind of helping, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, especially from Canada? I mean, I don't know if there's really a difference between entrepreneurs in the U.S. and Canada, but if there's something that kind of excites you in helping these technopreneurs in Canada, wh what would that be? If if that you know if if we can even qualify that. Well, we, the best, the things that really excite us in terms of investing in companies is just like the technology, if it's a great opportunity and we just see like, this is something that could have a very amazing impact on whatever industry it's selling into. Uh, that's very exciting. And also it's just the people as well. It's important for a VC to uh, like the people who are running the company. And I, I would say that the opposite is true as well. Like the entrepreneur needs to like, enjoy, you know, we're talking about uh, the intangibles here, enjoy the VC who's investing in them. Because given the fact that it's a partnership and VCs are expected to work alongside the portfolio companies, they really need to get along. So right. if, if, so if an entrepreneur is passionate, you know, a f all around fun person to be around, uh, it's going to make dealing with them like just such a pleasurable uh, experience as opposed to, you know, of someone else who maybe there isn't a personality fit there. You know, it's interesting, Stuart, you mentioned that because I was I was going to say, you know, I, wa I watch Shark Tank a lot um, and I've seen, you know, uh, entrepreneurs pitching and then they would argue, almost fight among the sharks, like especially, you know, Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, Canadian but guy, yep. Right, yeah, but they still end up <laughs> investing on that person or that company. So I guess my question is, how important is the chemistry between investors and entrepreneurs since you mentioned that you know you gotta make sure that they they get along but like i said again that's tv so i don't know what happens behind the scenes but how important is the chemistry among the investors and the entrepreneurs uh the the chemistry is extremely important and so just you know i i teach uh venture capital and private equity to an mba school as well as a master of finance program mm -hmm. and often people bring up shark tank or dragon's den and <laughs> um compare it and I don't, I don't like doing it that much because it is reality TV. 
It's like, you know, watching the Kardashians and thinking that's how a family <laughs> normally <laughs> behaves or something like that. So, um, but, but I could tell you though, um, if they're arguing with the entrepreneur or challenging them, it, it, it's, it's very likely they're actually testing them hmm. without, without them really realizing because they, they want to see if, if they're open to uh, suggestions from them and, and push back. And they want to see how they handle stress because I'm sure you, you could attest to being an entrepreneur is extremely stressful and having a partner, you know, is like any relationship, there's going to be conflict. So if you could see early on how they handle com- a conflicting kind of situation and how they handle stress, uh, that could be a good indicator on uh, how, how likely you're going to get along with them uh, moving into the future if your partner's uh, for a business. Of course, no, I, I completely understand. And really, when you get into partnership with whether it's a VC or a business partner, um, it really is like getting married. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you you know you've got a contract, and you're going to be talking and spending time with that uh, person uh, all the time. So I, I definitely see how chemistry plays a critical role. Um, now, Stuart, in a year. How many how many business plans or how many pitch do you usually evaluate? You know, from companies trying to raise money, if I may ask. A ton. <laughs> I don't even know. I can't even give you that number because I'm on I'm on the investment committee of an Ontario government backed fund that has about 350 million in assets under management, uh-huh. and so I see a ton of pitches through them. Uh, I'm a judge on many different. Um, uh, startup pitch competitions. Uh, I got I get companies introduced to me all the time from friends uh, in the industry, whether they're accountants, lawyers, uh, other venture capital funds, incubators. So I mean, I'm guessing it's got to be in the hundreds. It's just constantly companies are are coming and, across my desk. Yeah. And say, for example, out of a hundred, how many companies actually get funded? In other words, what's a typical, you know, what's, you know, what's a percentage success rate of, you know, out of all pitches, what's a typical percentage of getting funded? I, I mean, I'm sure there's stats out there that, that could quote this a heck of a lot better than me, but um, sure. I, I, you know what, it could be like one in 400 get oh, financed. Wow. But, the, but remember the, these aren't, I'm, I'm talking like, um, Come, I'm not talking about companies who who necessarily uh, pitch VCs, like get to the stage where they're in front of a VC in the boardroom and, and presenting the company. I'm just talking about like the number of companies that are out there that I see. Yeah, that's that's basically it. But, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that there's tons of good companies out there that aren't getting funding or can't be successful by not getting financed by a VC. Sure. No, and, and really the reason why I asked that is in, I don't know if I was correct to frame it that way, but I was I, I was gonna I was gonna ask um, what are the typical reasons why companies are not getting funded? And I, I know it's easy to say the opposite of the top three that you mentioned earlier of you know how to get funded, but really, what are the typical maybe top three that you see as red flags? So maybe companies or people listening right now can should avoid when they're pitching to venture capitalists? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, well, let me, I just want to say one thing, because I don't want to have this conversation sound too negative. Yeah, um, sure. There's many, many companies out there and many types of businesses can be successful on their own without getting funded by a VC. Like VCs have a very small window of, of, the type of companies that they are even able to invest in given their legal obligations with their limited partners or their investors. So, and I tell entrepreneurs this all the time, like ones that are pitching me or mentoring, I'll say like, look, you know, you're not going to get funded by a venture capital fund and they seem upset. And I'm saying like, look, I'm not saying you have a bad company. I think your company is amazing. It just doesn't fit in with the, investment thesis of the typical VC funds that are in Canada. So just, you know, don't go barking up the wrong tree. So I would say first entrepreneurs need to understand 
if not? And if not, you know, if there's other ways to make your company successful. Um, the other thing, so in terms of uh, like red flags or things that would kind of turn us off, obviously, um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, a lot of companies pitch VCs way too early and they don't have enough traction or validation in the market. And the very common thing that entrepreneurs will hear from venture capitalists in Canada, maybe they're just trying to be polite. They'll just say, you know, we love what you're doing, but your company's not ready yet. Get back to us in a year or so and let us know if you're able to achieve these milestones that you've kind of set out. So being too early, that's another thing. Um, a, a com another common problem that uh, entrepreneurs have is they're just not able to articulate their value proposition. Especially, and this, this seems to be typical for entrepreneurs who have like an engineering background because they, they create this amazing tech uh, solution, but they, they sometimes don't seem able to articulate what the solution is and how it's going to benefit people. And so I find myself, you know, at events, um, obviously pre COVID, uh, you're getting a coffee and then an entrepreneur will come up to me and, and be telling me about this, this company that are ha they are managing that they're very excited about and tell me about the technology and they can be talking for 20 minutes straight. And I'll go away from the meeting thinking, I have no idea what this, this person does. I have no, I have absolutely no, no clue. And, uh, and it happens, it happens a lot. Um, Another thing is, is that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, they, so, so given that there's so many companies pitching VCs all the time, they know that VCs have a low attention span generally for, for companies when they're getting shown ideas. And, you know, the, the worry from the entrepreneur standpoint is like, oh, I'm, you know, I, they might seem interested right now or somewhat on the fence, but it's only a matter of time when the next shiny object's going to walk in the room and they're going to be on that. So that causes entrepreneurs to try to hold the attention and keep the excitement of the VCs. And, and that can be kind of a slippery slide where they start kind of bending the truth or, you know, flat out lying. And uh, once an entrepreneur gets caught in that sort of situation, then there's no going back from that because, you know, we talk about relationships and partnering and stuff like that. And, and you can't have a, a good relationship without trust. So once the trust factor is compromised, um, it's it's very hard to dial that back again and, and rebuild from there. Sure. No, I can imagine, like you said, you know, with so many companies pitching and, they, you know, the moment that that's basically a fundamental, I guess, uh, important matter that has to be taken care of, you know, trust. Uh, with so many companies pitching there, the moment you lose that, or I could imagine how you could easily lose the interest of a, of a VC. Um, now, let's say for companies who may not fit into that VC uh, category to be funded, what are alternative funding sources that you see? Let's say you see a company, maybe they're good, you like what they're doing, the potential is there but for some reason it doesn't fit into what the VCs are looking for, especially VCs from Canada. Are there other kind of funding alternatives and what could those be? Okay, so I would say, I mean, this any, any company should think of this, and this might sound like painfully obvious, but I'm just mm -hmm. gonna blurt it out anyways. If a company is early, I think the, what they should really, really, really focus on is generating revenue in any way that they can. Right. And so that could be bootstrapping, that could be implementing a minimum viable product strategy. When we're talking about companies getting financed, if they're in an early stage, there's not a ton of options. They could get financed by an angel investor, maybe friends and family. But I mean, whether they can get that capital or not, I think when an entrepreneur sets out to start a business, they should be laser focused on getting money through revenue. I mean, it sounds obvious, but a lot of people start businesses with the intention of getting it financed by other means. And the reality of the situation is, is, is that's kind of not um, a great strategy because 
and any any financier will want to see some level of traction and and you need to be able to build that out so what i was suggesting is basically that an entrepreneur uh consider bootstrapping their company and uh offering services like consulting or teaching or you know doing whatever they can to bring money into their business aside from just seeking external sources well that's 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 a great advice i mean i've heard several friends of mine i mean they've grown their companies to multi million dollar now but i asked them and i asked like three questions in similar situations when they asked what could you have done differently when you were starting up and three of them actually told me i wish i focused more on sales versus trying to raise funds <laughs> And the reason why they say that is because they lost so much leverage on equity in doing so, but then realized later that they could have actually raised the funds if they actually sold and spend more time selling versus trying to raise funds. So I think that's that's a really sound advice that I think a lot of people uh, or a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize. So I'm, I'm glad that you actually mentioned that, Stuart. Yeah, no problem. I think what this pandemic did, obviously, as you're aware, you know, millions of unemployed Americans here. I'm not sure what your unemployment or how many were affected there in Canada. And I hear a lot of people considering opening a business now. Well, one, out of necessity, they got to make money. They have no job. What advice do you have for them? I mean, as a fellow entrepreneur, not just on the funding side, but should they pursue? I mean, what, what advice do you have for these people? Okay. So, I mean, it is, it is very, it is a, we are in a very difficult situation. So my heart goes out to people who are struggling right now, because I mean, it's, it's, it's very tough. Um, so here's what I can say to that. Um, and I hope this could resonate or help. Um, entrepreneurship is all about looking into a market and finding problems and then creating solutions for those problems and making a profit along the way. When you're in an economic crisis, there's no more uh, situation, there's no more problems out there than you're, you're having right now because there's all these people out there suffering. So if you could find a way to, to look, take inventory, whatever resources you have, your skills, your abilities, you know, whatever assets you own, and um, and then get out there and try to find problems that you can solve uh, utilizing your unique uh, set of skills and, and other assets and, and do that to generate income. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can definitely see how that, you know, how that's what how people should be doing that right now. And you're right. I think I think not. I wouldn't say the gig economy, but the consultancy. I see a lot of new consultants popping up, and that's great because obviously they're they're basically converting their skill set, their expertise into revenue. And I applaud that. You know, we as as entrepreneurs, you have to you have to be able to hustle, right? <laughs> I'm sure you can agree with that, Stuart. You really oh, have to be sure. able to, to hustle. Otherwise, you will not be able to convert your time to money. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Stuart, we are at the end of our show here. I really appreciate you spending time with us today. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of our listeners would like to connect with you. What is the best way to connect with you, Stuart? Uh, they can email me. I'll put my email in the chat here. Um, so it's sbrown at uh, pycap.ca. So that's mm -hmm. S-B-R-O-W-N-E at P-Y-C-A-P dot C-A. Or they could, they could send it to uh, info at pycap.ca as well. Awesome. And your website is? Oh, it's uh, pycap.ca. So P-Y-C-A-P dot C-A. Awesome. Perfect. Well, Stuart, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. I'm sure our audience, you know, have learned so much. I've learned so much today. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, I wish you Great. the best. Yes, sir. 
Oh, yeah. No, thank you as well. I mean, I, I saw that you wanted me to answer one more question in regards to this uh, new product uh, or service we uh, happen to be launching. And I'd be happy to um, describe one of the things we've been working on that's yes, quite please. new for us. Yeah, I, okay, didn't know so. I was ready yet to, you know, I, I was, I know we spoke about that a few months ago, but please, I would love you to tell our audience what the, what's the latest and the greatest. Well, this, uh, this is, a, I think this is a good way to kind of end things as well, because it's actually full circle to my, uh, to the beginning of this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Well, our, our private, our venture capital firm is actually, believe it or not, producing our own uh, little film series uh, oh. that we're doing on the side. And it's uh, it's kind of Black Mirror esque, and um, it's it's also we call it an edutainment, so education and entertainment. So it's we, we've had a lot of crazy experiences over the last ten years. Like I've traveled, you know, for as a venture capitalist, flown to Mongolia, Mexico, all over China, Slovenia, Austria, and a few other places. And of course, we've seen like the most crazy bleeding edge technology and the most interesting and uh, mad scientist type entrepreneurs. And we just have so many stories to tell. We thought, you know, why not put it into a uh, film series? And uh, we partnered up with this production company. So they're taking care of all of the, the production of it. And our team at PiCap, we're doing all the writing of the screenplays and uh, doing the casting and stuff like that. So it's a really fun experience. We just wrapped our first episode from the filming standpoint uh, last weekend and that's in post-production so we're really wow. excited to be uh, launching that uh very soon that is so cool now how are we how can we actually see that or watch those episodes well we'll be um providing uh information on our website like on our blog and um if if uh any of your listeners want to follow me on social media we'll be providing uh, images from the production set and of course um, information about our fund too and our the achievements of our portfolio companies so yeah if they want to um, follow me on social media i'll put my um and all i guess instagram is the, the best one that we've been using lately so it's just uh stuart underscore brown so that's s-t-u-a-r-t underscore b-r-o-w-n-e and um, I'll, I'll provide uh, information on how they could watch the series uh, once so, it's available. And when, when, when are you, what's your expected date as to when that's going to be available, Stuart? Well, it's going to be a few months at least because um, we've been getting a lot of excitement just, uh, you know, under the radar for what we're producing. And we're thinking we, we a, a good launch for the series might be uh, sending it out to all of the film festivals and uh, seeing what their uptake is like. And because a lot of them have requirements that you can't release it online until it's premiered at the festival. So we have to kind of wait a little bit for that, but um, we'll be providing uh, more information as it becomes available uh, through social media and, and on our uh, website as well. Well, Stuart, what do you know? Travel dream happening today, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, Full so circle, that's, eh? <laughs> yeah, so that's exciting. I'm super excited for you. We'll, we'll definitely watch out for that. Um, so I just wanted to repeat your Instagram handle, which is Stuart underscore Brown, S-T-U-A-R-T underscore B-R-O-W-N-E. So for our followers, please uh, follow Stuart on Instagram there. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure this, this will be an exciting, you know, entertaining and educational, uh, especially for those who are, you know, aspiring or entrepreneurs. Um, we're excited, man. Looking forward to it. Yes, sounds great. Thanks a lot, Chris. It was great chatting with you and happy to um, come back on the show anytime you need me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, uh, Stuart. Um, that concludes our show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this show was brought to you by Gaptic Global, your one-stop shop outsourcing company for LinkedIn marketing, customer service, and various back office services. You can learn more about their services at www.gaptecglobal.com. This has been your host, Chris Yap, of the podcast show, From Zero to Revenue. As Stephen Covey said, all things are created twice, 
first in the mind, then in reality. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of From Zero to Revenue with your host, Chris Yap. If you've enjoyed the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and review on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.